Kia ora team, welcome to uh, our first flip video on Achievement Standard 91328, uh, which is demonstrate an understanding of how and why biophysical principles relate to the learning of physical skills. In this video, we are going to look at um, specifically joints and movements um, around the joint, and we will touch on bones and muscles. Now, these, uh, this will just be a recap on um, topics that you covered last year in Level 1. So, um, we'll only touch very briefly on, on some of the joints, movements and bones and muscles in this video. Learning outcome though, um, we'd like you to be able to identify, name and describe a range of joints, joint types, movements around a joint and some bones and muscles. So first of all, joints are places in the body where bones meet. The degree of movement from each joint depends on the function of the joint. Some joints have no movement and others have a considerable range of motion at that joint. The three main types of joints in the body are fibrous joints, cartilaginous joints and synovial joints. We will focus a little bit more on synovial joints um, and you'll see why shortly. Fibrous joints are bound together by fibrous tissue. If you look to the, um, the image on the right there, um, we have a suture joint in the cranium and if you look closely at that image, you can see um, the light blue fibrous connective tissue, which holds those bones, um, uh, binds those bones there uh, to one another. So there's no joint cavity um, in this joint, and there is very little motion available at that joint. Cartilaginous, uh, cartilaginous joints, and uh, in, in these joints, the bones are joined together by cartilage. This type of joint, again, has no cavity, similar to the um, fibrous joint, but it does have a good degree of resiliency and allows um, a little bit of movement. Looking to the left there, um, you can see that the ribs are joined to the sternum uh, by that cartilage. Synovial joints. As I mentioned earlier, um, because our learning area, physical education, is more concerned with movement, we place greater emphasis on the uh, synovial, uh, synovial joint within the, within the body. Um, and we'll look at the six main types of synovial joints um, on the next few pages. The one big difference between uh, synovial joints and, and the joints I mentioned, mentioned previously is that they have a uh, joint cavity. And this cavity is filled with synovial fluid and that kind of lubricates the bones um, and allows that movement to happen a little bit easier. So the first synovial joint we're going to look at is a gliding joint. A gliding joint is also called a plane joint. Um, in this joint the articulating surfaces of the bones are flat or only slightly curved. So this type of joint um, really allows bones to glide past each other. And you see on the, on the left there um, an example of a, of a gliding joint and that's found in um, the tarsals of your feet um, where there's not a whole lot of movement but there is that gliding movement uh, within those tarsals. Condyloid joint. So a condyloid joint has a distinctive oval shape. The articular surface of the bone inserting into the joint is shaped like an oval and the cavity which receives the bone is shaped like a bowl. And the example we have there on the right is, um, is a condyloid joint which is occurring in the carpals of your wrist. Hinge joint. In a hinge joint the, the convex part of a bone fits into the concave part of another bone. And this is named a hinge joint, it's, it's, it's pretty clear in this because the joint operates in a similar fashion as the hinge of a door. So it only allows motion uh, in one plane. And the example we have there is an elbow joint where you see um, the humerus, um, where it articulates uh, with the ulna at your elbow. Saddle joint. So the saddle joint forms between bones whose joining surfaces have both concave and convex regions. The surface of one bone fits the surface of another, similar to a horse rider sitting on a saddle. Now, um, the example on the right there, um, a saddle joint at the thumb, and if you um, if you if you look at those uh, the two surfaces, you can kind of see how that allows the type of movement that we have um, with our thumb, and it's because of that saddle joint. Ball and socket joint. In a ball and socket joint, the end of one bone creates a ball-shaped surface and that fits into a, a cup-like depression on another bone and we call that cup-like depression uh, the acetabulum. So this type of joint allows the most movement of all the synovial joints and, and this is basically the reason why you see so many um, 
so many shoulder injuries because that's a ball and socket joint and and the one I guess the one difference between a shoulder ball and socket joint and a hip ball and socket joint is the hip ball and socket joint the acetabulum's a little bit deeper so um, the ball sits a little um, or, the, or the head of that bone head of the femur actually sits a little tighter into the acetabulum in the, um, in the shoulder joint um, that acetabulum is, is much more shallow so you don't um, so it's more susceptible to injury. Pivot joint. So the pivot joint allows the cylindrical surface of one bone to rotate within a ring formed of another bone. The only pivot joint located in the human body is located between the, the first two uh, cervical vertebrae known as the atlas and the at axis vertebrae. This joint allows you to um, pivot your head and turn it from left to right. Movements that occur at uh, synovial joints, um, and there's a range of movements that, that occur and it's really important that you have a, a good grasp and understanding of these movements because um, you really need to be able to describe them well in this achievement standard. So we've got movements like abduction, circumduction, plantar flexion, pronation, dorsiflexion, flexion, extension, rotation, supination, and adduction. So you need to have a good understanding of each of these terms, um, and we're going to look a little bit closely at them now. So first of all, flexion and extension. Um, now flexion can be defined as movement where the angle of the joint decreases, and you can see that image on the right. We're getting um, that elbow flexion, and um, you can see that the angle of the joint decreases. Extension can be defined as movement where the angle of the joint increases, so it's opposite to flexion, and again, you can see that pretty clear in that image there. Joints that can cause flexion and extension include the elbow, knee, shoulder, and hip. Adduction and abduction. Adduction is where a limb moves toward the midline of the body. Abduction is when a limb moves away from the midline of the body. Joints where adduction and abduction can occur include the hip joint and the shoulder joint. Now, uh, a way I like to remember the difference between the two terms is adduction is, is adding to the midline of the body. So I take the, the first three letters of, of adduction, and that's add, and I use that to remember. Adduction is when I'm adding to the midline of the body. Circumduction. Circumduction takes place when a joint causes a circular movement of a limb. Joints that can cause circumduction include the shoulder and the hip. Now that diagram is not too clear. So if you're wondering what circumduction looks like, if you, um, if you point your toe, if you extend your leg and point your toe and draw a circle with your toe, that movement there is circumduction. Supination and pronation. Supination describes the position of the forearm in which the palm is facing upwards. Pronation is the opposite and describes the position of the forearm in which the palm is facing downwards. Now, and, uh, again, another way I like to use to remember these two terms, or the difference between these two terms, is supination. I like to remember that if I was asking for a bowl of soup, I would turn my hand upwards. And for pronation, I like to think that if I was a professional basketballer in my dreams, um, when I bounce the basketball, um, I'm pronating my forearm. So just two simple ways you can uh, remember the difference between those two terms. Rotation occurs when a body part spins either internally or externally around the axis of a joint. A rotation can occur in the shoulder and the hip. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. So dorsiflexion describes the movement that decreases the angle between the top of the foot and the leg so that the toes are brought closer to the shin. Plantar flexion describes the movement of the foot that flexes the foot or the toes downward towards the sole of the foot. Um, I guess the, probably an easy way to think about it is if you are uh, planting your foot before you jump, um, that's, that's plantar flexion, so really planting your foot and and uh, getting up onto your toes to, to jump, if you like. Now, bones and muscles. While we have a strong emphasis of bones and muscles at level 1P, it is important that you spend some time reviewing your knowledge and recall around this area because it, it does play a big part and there's, there's, it's, there's almost too many bones and muscles to sit down and talk about in one sitting. So we do put some of the onus onto you to do um, some, some reviewing of your knowledge around that. 
So I'd like you to take a look at the following two videos by clicking on the pop-ups. Uh, one's about seven minutes, the other one's about nine minutes, I, I think, but it just gives you a bit of a, uh, an overview around the um, skeletal system and the muscul uh, muscular system that will help um, as we progress through the unit. But in saying that, you really do need to, to have a sit down and, and, and look at a bone chart and a muscle chart and start um, considering learning um, some of those key bones and muscles. So that's it for today. Um, we will have a discussion about this video in class. Um, so make sure you complete your worksheets and we will talk in our next theory lesson. Cheers.